Thank you, Brad. Um, Brad did not introduce himself, so I will introduce oh. him. He is uh, Pastor Brad Ryder, and he pastors the Island, let me see here, Island Road Evangelical Methodist Church, Bluntville, Bluntville, Tennessee. I learned the hard way that I pronounce it Bluntville, and I was quickly corrected. But he serves as our uh, American Council's vice president, so so glad that uh, uh, he's able to uh, serve in this capacity. Glad you made it out. Glad you found Davidson Baptist Church, and I hope that you're looking forward to uh, an encouraging time in God's Word. You might wonder, what does global warming have to do with the message that we just heard? Um, well, I hope to tie those things together and that you'll see that it is not a forced thing. Uh, but I really appreciate it. I'm not just saying that because I like Matt, but I do. Uh, but that was an excellent message, a great challenge. Um, programs can change, but the message does not. Amen. So a great encouragement and reminder for us uh, this evening, this afternoon. Sadly, truth is often sought to be changed by society. And this is one way that that happens. Um, I have a fire hose to give you in the next 45 minutes to an hour. Um, I'm going to go somewhat fast, and then maybe I might slow it down a little bit, and then maybe I might pick it up. Um, if you are like me, you like to take notes, and I might go a little fast for you. So let me uh, help a little bit. I do have two sign-up sheets back there, along with the other literature for the American Council. One sign-up sheet is to get on our mailing list so that you can receive things in the mail and also via email. The other sign-up sheet looks like this. And if you would like a copy of my notes that I'm speaking from, I can get you that. If you would like a copy of uh, like the PowerPoint slides, I will send you that. Um, that way you can just you know change it. You can put your name on it. I don't care. <laughs> it, what matters is the truth gets out. Or this is not copyrighted. One thing that I will also send you is, um, in, and in the sign-up sheet, I, I say, I will send you a copy of my notes and a PDF of this article. I leave the PowerPoint optional up to you because that can be a large file. Um, but this article is actually a journal article. It's called A Proposed Bible Science Perspective on Global Warming. This is an academic research paper. It is excellent. I just, I cannot encourage you enough to get this. This is not something you read in Sunday school though, okay? You need to read it, digest it, put it in your own words. I've incorporated a, a number of things from there into my presentation here. Let's begin with prayer. Oh Lord God, you are the God of the heavens and the earth. You have created all things and by your power sustain them and direct them to your ends and your purposes. Lord, there is not a, a sparrow that falls apart, not only from your knowledge, but your will. Lord, you sent your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to live a perfect life, to die as our substitute, to be raised from the dead for our justification, to ascend into heaven. And we thank you, Lord, for the reminder that he is coming again to judge the world. God, we must be stewards, faithful stewards, of the truth that you have entrusted to us. Thank you so much for that encouragement and that reminder uh, from our brother Matt. Lord, this is an opportunity for us now uh, to put that into practice as we consider a way, Lord, that unbelief seeks to uh, change your truth, to add to it, to dilute it, to... Uh, destroy it, Lord, to change the what the church should be about and what the church should be like. Lord, I pray, help us, give us understanding, but we especially pray that the Lord Jesus Christ will have the preeminence in all things. We pray this, uh, knowing that you hear us because of him. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. A biblical assessment of global warming. First, a definition. Global warming often equated with this expression of climate change, refers to the belief that increasing warming of the earth since the industrial age will, ca will cause a global catastrophe unless immediate drastic actions are taken. If you pay attention to the news, even if you don't pay attention to the news, 
You know exactly the kind of uh, emotional rhetoric that is often given about this subject. We are told that global warming is the issue of our time, that it is caused by man, that it is a moral, ethical, and spiritual issue. The World Health Organization calls global warming the greatest threat to health in this century. Now, whenever I hear those kinds of expressions, when it's only the year 21 of this century, I always think, do they have some kind of gift of insight into knowing what's coming in the next 79 years or so? Well, they are trying to say, this is what is going to happen. This is what is going to happen. First, let's begin with the causes and effects of global warming. The causes of global warming, and this is from their perspective. Sometimes when I do something like this presentation uh, at our church, um, I will get questions from our folks as I'm presenting it and say, Pastor, do you actually believe that? And that tells me I'm doing a good job at saying what they believe because I presented it in such a way that this is what they say. And this is what I'm doing in this first part is this is what they say. And I would encourage you, we need to accurately understand what is being said in order to make a biblical assessment of that. The causes of global warming. The assertion is this. They assert that humanity generates so much greenhouse gases, primarily carbon dioxide, by burning fossil fuels, that that raises the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere artificially, and it is increasing the Earth's surface temperature. The United Nations said this, quote, after more than a century and a half of industrialization, deforestation, and large-scale agriculture, quantities of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere have risen to record levels not seen in three million years. Again, we must ask, who did you know <laughs> two and a half million years ago? I continue the quote. As populations, economies, and standards of living grow, so does the cumulative level of greenhouse gas emissions. What effects are there that they say that come from this global warming phenomenon? The United States Global Change Research Program, this is a federal program that you're so glad to know that your federal tax dollars are supporting and paying for, said so this, quote, thousands of studies conducted by researchers around the world have documented increases in temperature at Earth's surface as well as in the atmosphere and oceans. Many other aspects of global climate are changing as well. High temperature extremes and heavy precipitation events are increasing. Glaciers and snow cover are shrinking and sea ice is retreating. Seas are warming, rising and becoming more acidic and flooding is becoming more frequent along the U.S. coastline. Growing seasons are longer, and large wildfires occur more frequently. Many species are moving to new locations, and changes in the seasonal timing of important biological events are occurring in response to climate change. In addition, others say that because of climate change, there is less snow. And as a resident in the snow belt of Ohio, I give a hearty amen to that. <laughs> that there are severe storms, there are extinction of animals and ecosystems, there's the increase of disease, there's famine, and as a result, riots, political instability, and civil unrest. It has gotten to the point, brothers and sisters, where you watch the news, you see something either in the environment or it's so sociologically happens in society happening, and I just have gotten to the point, call me jaded, where I'm expecting the interviewer to ask this loaded question. Yes. Do you think this is a result of climate change or yes. global warming? And of course the individual is going to say, absolutely. <laughs> so how do they propose to lessen global warming? You'll like the picture that I put up there 
of this is what's going to happen if we don't fix global warming. The earth is just going to disintegrate and human life will die. So how do they say, recommend that global warming is lessened? Most advocate controlling carbon dioxide emissions. Reduce the cutting and burning of forests and of course plant trees. The beliefs are largely these. I can summarize these in four basic beliefs. The first, in past millennia, the, cur the earth only had carbon dioxide. It did not have oxygen. Number two, oxygen has come through photosynthesis. Number three, carbons are stored and oxygen is generated primarily through forests the photosynthesis procedure through that. And number four, the necessity of reducing the cutting and burning of forests and planting of trees. These are the main ways that they say, that people say, that governments say, that schools say, that global warming must be lessened. However, you know I have to throw a however in there. A research paper was done in 2017 by Seth Wins and Kimberly Nichols. Nicholas. These are not Bible believers. Far from it. They are evolutionists. They believe in global warming. But they demonstrate that governments and schools are only implementing middle to low impact. Middle to low impact actions to curb global warmings. And some of these middle to low impact things are drive an electric car, have efficient heating and cooling, use solar panels, reduce, reuse, recycle, plant trees. Do you notice a theme recurring there? And compost things. They say those really are only middle to lower. Those really will not do the job. Their research is amazing to look at. They list four things if we're really going to reach those high level things. And the four high level things, number one, outstrips all of them. 60% of it. The first thing that they said you need to do in order to really impact and stem global warming is have one fewer child per family. Number two, to live car free. Number three, avoid one transatlantic flight. Number four, eat vegetarian. And every time I see something along that line, I always think of when the Lord Jesus appeared to Peter in Acts chapter 10, and he said, rise, Peter, kill, and eat. That's my biblical basis for eating hot dogs. But these authors advocate teaching this to adolescents because adolescents are in that ideal group in that ideal time to change society and save the earth. The picture that I have here, it is not something to just be, well, emotional about. They really are convinced the earth needs saving. Well, this is not something that is held just by unbelievers. There are also, also is a growing concern and action by what I put as Christians. First, let me begin with the World Council of Churches. You know, we have to address them. They have an entire branch dealing with global warming. Quote, the World Council of Churches says, quote, The Bible teaches the wholeness of creation and calls human beings to take care of the Garden of Eden, Genesis 2.15, unquote. You kind of want to ask them, do you know your Bible? Yeah. Pope Francis, in his 2015 encyclical, Laudato Si, said thus, The establishment of a legal framework which can set clear boundaries and ensure the protection of ecosystem has become indispensable. Otherwise, the new power structures based on the techno-economic paradigm, may overwhelm not only our politics, but also freedom and justice. Now, that was quite a mouthful from the Argentinian Pope. If you'd like to read more about this, shameless plug, the American Council passed a resolution about this. We have a copy of it back there, a resolution regarding this. So what the Pope is saying here is, 
if we really want to deal with global, the, the global warming issue, we need to establish a legal framework that can set boundaries and protect the ecosystems. Because frankly, he says, the techno-economic paradigm right now is not going to do it. What is he referring to with the techno, the current, present techno-economic paradigm? He is talking about capitalism. And he is saying that capitalism is what is killing the earth and killing humanity. We need to do away with capitalism. We need this legal global framework. He's recently been pushing this again to deal with this great crisis. A recent Pew Research poll showed that 28% of white evangelicals are gravely concerned about this global warming threat. Coming more to the evangelical side, there's a group called Eden's Vigil. Eden's Vigil. Last week, Christianity Today wrote an article about them. And it was not an article just giving news, it was an article promoting them. I'd like to say I came across this article, but I must give credit where credit's due. We have a trucker in our church. He knew I was giving a presentation on this, and he sent me the link to it. I'm so thankful for truckers. Our trucker reads Augustine and Calvin. And he has cut off shirt sleeves and a, and a hat, and he looks like a trucker. But he is theologically knowledgeable. Christianity Today said in describing Eden, Eden's vigil that they are, quote, training missionaries to integrate environmental concerns with the Great Commission to make disciples of all nations. It has become essential to fulfilling the Great Commission. Eden's vigil partners with the Lausanne movement, which was Billy Graham was very instrumental in starting and the World Evangelical Association. You might not be familiar with the World Evangelical Association. They are like the worldwide version of the National Association of Evangelicals. Eden's Vigil has established a prayer campaign for the upcoming United Nations Climate Change Conference in Glasgow, Scotland, sometimes called COP26. Two weeks ago, for the, uh, the Parliament of World Religions had a free webinar. I'm all about free, being Dutch. And they had a webinar about how we can need to work together to pray, gather together, pray all our different religious organizations for COP26. Eden's Vigil seems to be joining right in there. Another evangelical group called Christians and Climate, an evangelical call to action. They say this, The same love for God and neighbor that compels us to preach salvation through Jesus Christ, protect the unborn, preserve the family and the sanctity of marriage, and take the whole gospel to a hurting world also compels us to recognize that human-induced climate change is a serious Christian issue requiring action now. Then they say all religious moral claims about climate change are relevant only if climate change is real and is mainly human-induced, everything hinges on the scientific data. See what the issues are and what they are saying. They are saying this. The science says this. That must control our service for Christ. Keep that in mind. The science says this. Remember millions of years? impacts what we must do for Christ. Who is on board with this group, Christians and Climate and Evangelical Call to Action? There are over 300 United States senior evangelical leaders of a broad evangelical coalition. Everyone from Leith Anderson, who is recent president of the NAE, to college presidents, to left-leaning evangelicals. This is what they are saying is essential gospel ministry. There are many other Christian climate action networks. I don't have time to go in detail through them all, or even just one of them. Let me give you just five. There's the Young Christian Climate Network. There's Young Evangelicals for Climate Action. Remember what they said earlier? We need to go after the adolescents. There's the Climate Caretakers. There's the Climate Witness 
I almost say protection every time, climate witness protection. Climate witness project. There's earth keepers, Christians for climate justice. There are, they're just springing up all over the place. It makes one ask because you hear it all the time. It's inundated. Is global warming true? Are these evangelical Christians correct? Should alleviating global warming, should it be part of the, Christ, of the, of the church's mission? Well, Christ's church must always evaluate everything from God's point of view. Amen. That is the only way. And the only way you can do that is by looking into God's written word. If you take anything away from this presentation this afternoon, I hope it is just you remember this line. There is God and everything else. Mm. And when you understand that, that helps you so much. It helps you so much in the worship of the church, to Christian living, to global warming. How so? In the beginning, what? God. And then what did God do? Created the heavens and the earth. There is God in everything else. The only way you can rightly understand the everything else is what has God said about it? You know, it's just simple, folks. What did God say? And we must believe that. We must believe that. So global warming from, a, from God's perspective. Global warming from God's perspective. In other words, from what did he say? What has he said in the scriptures about this? First, we need to understand some terms. Does that look familiar? I'm looking at our hosts. I worked hard to find a good aerial picture of Hazard, Kentucky, and there you have it right now. It's beautiful here. We need to understand some terms before continuing because this is essential for correctly discussing any issues, any issue. What is weather? Weather is current atmospheric conditions. What's the weather outside, we ask. What is climate? Climate is the average weather and conditions at a specific place and time of year. What is the climate in Kentucky in April? What is the climate in New Hampshire in April? Brother Kevin can tell you that right now. They have about 30 feet of snow <laughs> currently settling. Well, that's an exaggeration. Climate change. Climate change is average long-term weather changes. Average long-term weather changes. It is observable and documentable. Global warming is the belief that the entire Earth's surface is warming and the Earth is going to die. Look at the first word that was put there in describing global warming. It is a belief. And we need to understand that. Frequently, climate change and global warming are used interchangeably. They're used synonymously, one for the other. And that is wrong. Because climate is objective, it is observable, and climates change. Mm -hmm. They change. Global warming is the idea, the opinion, the belief, that because the Earth's entire surface is warming, the earth and humanity are threatened, and if nothing's done, are doomed. That is a belief, because you can't ob objectively see that. It cannot be quantified. We must recognize, before we get into the biblical assessment, that global warming, that idea of it, is entirely based on the evolutionary perspective. You must understand that, folks. It is entirely based on an atheistic evolutionary perspective. So some biblical things to consider. First is creation, Genesis 1 and 2. God created everything directly, immediately, in six literal days. Nothing evolved. God created the atmosphere with a perfect level of carbon dioxide and oxygen. God created plants and animals 
and they enjoyed that perfect balance of carbon dioxide and oxygen. Something else about God's creation that is perfect, oxygen comes primarily not from trees, but plankton. This is something that I have substantiated, not from Bible scientists, but from atheistic scientists. You look it up, Google it. I did it this afternoon just to make sure I wasn't giving you false information. Where does oxygen primarily come from? And every time you will see from plankton in the oceans. God created man. God gave him dominion over the earth. He is not equal with, much less, less than anything in creation. Why was earth created? It was created for man's sustenance, for his use, for his enjoyment as he honors God. Secondly, Adam's sin cursed the earth. Genesis 3, 17 and 19. Let us hear the word of the Lord. Verse 17. Cursed is the ground for thy sake, and sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Look at that. The effects of sin affect the environment that continue throughout history all the days of thy life. Verse 18. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. Because of sin, the earth now has dangerous and harmful effects upon humanity. Thorns. Thistles. Verse 19. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, till thou return unto the ground. For out of it wast thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust thou shalt return. In other words, man has to continually struggle to stay alive. Famine will never be eradicated. This will always happen. I am 51 years old. And I remember the 1980s when they were making pointed efforts to try to eradicate famine. And then they did it in the 1990s. And then they did it in the 2000s. They're doing it again in the teens. They're doing it again now. It will never happen by man. Why? Because it's part of the curse. It's part of the curse. You must understand that. Third, the worldwide flood of Genesis 6 through 9. The flood was God's judgment on sinful mankind. You know what the flood did? It added a couple drops of water to the plants or to the surface of the, the earth, didn't it? It covered the earth with water. And keep this in mind, all plants were destroyed, and there was never a shortage of oxygen. Why? Because it comes through plankton, doesn't it? Buried plants became fossil fuels, coal, oil, gas, etc., an ice age followed the flood, causing ice at the poles, massive snow, large glacial sheets, and so we need to keep in mind that the polar caps, they either did not exist before the flood, or they were destroyed by the flood. So when we hear about the polar caps are melting, we're all going to die. And as, as glaciers grew, ocean levels dropped. As they melted, they rose again. Following battle, people moved to different areas. Eventually, glaciers melted. The sea, the sea level rose, inland lakes evaporated, and deserts developed. As climates changed, plants and animals migrated accordingly. It's just not livable here, and so they moved to where it was livable. Abundant grasslands and animal herds near the poles became extinct as they grew colder. As populations increased, people converted wilderness lands for agricultural purposes. Glaciers continue to melt, sea levels continue to rise. What have glaciers been doing ever since the flood? They've been melting. They've been melting. Most glacial melt occurred before the industrial age. Climates have been constantly changing since the flood. Living things have always adapted to climate changes. And remember, that is objective. You can see it happen. So melting glaciers, increasing carbon dioxide, 
changing climates and slight changes in surface temperatures are not evidences of global warming. They are the continued after effects of the flood. God's promise, God has promised the continuation of earth and humanity. So far, the three things that I've given you are extremely important. They lay the foundation. I have found great encouragement from these promises. There's four I'd like to give you. There are so many more. The first is that on the left there, the earth cycles will continue with regularity while the earth remains. At the, after the end, God told Noah in Genesis 8, 22, while the earth remaineth, seed time and harvest, and cold and heat, and summer and winter, and day and night shall not cease. This was not a man who said this. This was our God who said that. Look what he said. Day and night. Seasons will continue. Seasons will continue. Earth's support of humanity will continue. Note it says seed time and harvest. There will always continue regular temperature variations. Cold and heat. <coughs> A second promise. God's promises in the new covenant in Jeremiah 20 or 33. He, the Lord uses the unchanging continuity of earth's cycles to illustrate his unchanging promises in the new covenant. Verses 20 to 21. Thus saith the Lord, if ye can break my covenant of the day and my covenant of the night, and that there should not be day and night in their season. Then may also my covenant be broken with David my servant, that he should not have a son to reign upon his throne, and with the Levites, the priests, my ministers. Thus saith the Lord, if my covenant be not with day and night, and if I have not appointed the ordinances of heaven and earth, then I will cast away the seed of Jacob and David my servant, so that I will not take any of his seed to be rulers over the seed of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, for I will cause their captivity to return and have mercy on them. A third thing. Jesus promised that the present heavens and earth would continue until God's word is fulfilled. Heaven and earth will not pass away until my word is fulfilled. Amen. What was the first part of that promise? Heaven and earth will not pass away. So what does Peter tell us? In 2 Peter chapter 3, Peter tells us it will pass away, won't it? And he admonished Christians to live holy lives until the Lord dissolves the present heavens and the earth. Mm -hmm. Will it dissolve? Peter says yes. What are you supposed to do until then? Keep it from happening. <laughs> no. Live a holy life. And that will not happen until every one of God's promises are accomplished. God will not destroy the earth because of humanity. I'm sorry, God will destroy the earth. And he will do so because of humanity's sin. What they have done on the earth, not to the earth. We are being told that the earth is dying because of what we are doing to it. God says, no, that's not going to happen. Genesis 8.22, it's going to continue. I base my promises of forgiveness of sins in the new covenant. Jesus said the new covenant is in my blood. I base that in the unchanging seasons of this world. The American Council of Christian Churches, one of our key um, aspects is our multi-denominational nature. I have greatly enjoyed representing the American Council over the years. Something that I found really interesting over the years, as I've gone to different churches and, and groups, they are surprised that there are fundamental believers in denominations different than theirs. <coughs> I have been in a Methodist church, an evangelical Methodist church, I'm not going to name it, it wasn't one of yours, where they said, I just can't believe that there's biblical Baptists out there. I have been with Presbyterians that have said the same thing about Baptists and Methodists. I've been with Baptists and Bible churches that said, there's, there's, no. In fact, when I first got started with the American Council uh, about 12 years ago, I had concerned individuals in my church. Pastor, I looked this group up. They have Methodists. They have Presbyterians. 
And you have to understand where they're coming from. The only Methodists and Presbyterians in our area are very left-leaning, Bible-denying. And it's been a great joy to teach them, you know what? We are not alone. <laughs> we are not alone. And part of the multi-denominational nature of that is, is we all keep our denominational distinctives in addressing these issues that come, that, that cut and attack the biblical faith. I do not set aside not one of my denominational distinctives. When I come to the American Council, I hold it entirely because the council isn't about planting churches and missionary work and things like that. It is, what are the issues that Satan is sending? And so I say all that to say, could there be different interpretations about the book of Revelation amongst the American Council under statement of the day? Yeah, there are. But God tells us those truths. He gives us that, 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 that scripture to relay something that he will do. And so I'm not pushing a particular interpretation of Revelation. But what does Revelation tell us will happen when God judges the world? Some descriptions that are given there are that there will be terrible earthquakes, wind, will cease. There will be destructive hail, massive fires. There will be the pollution of both fresh and salt waters. There will be the loss of sunlight. The sun's heat will increase, scorching humanity. There will be the destruction of islands and mountains. That's one of the things that global warming uh, people say, that the islands are just going to be consumed. There will be massive destructive hail. But my point here is why will God judge? He will judge it because of sinners. He will judge it because of sinners. My last scripture I'll draw your attention to. I'm not covering these in canonical order. Obviously, I was up until this point. But in Job 38 to 39, this is my, my capstone, if you will. God, not man, controls the earth and its climates. Amen. Job tells the story, the book of Job tells us the story about how there are different assessments of how God administers his justice. Satan has one opinion. Job's friends have another opinion. Job himself, he started off well, but as time went on, as you read the book of Job, he comes to a, a different assessment. I am being unjustly treated by God. I wish I had some kind of an umpire between me and God to, to work this out. In Job 38 and 39, God speaks. And he shows his total control over every aspect of life. To correct Job's assertion that God has been unjust in his dealings. God, Job said, God, you have been unjust. You have been unjust in your dealings. And Job or I'm sorry, God shows in Genesis in Job 38 and 39 that no one can control his control, no one can comprehend his control of the universe. Just quickly going down through 38 and 39, from the foundation and the measurement of creation, the controlling of the seas, the dawn, the very depths and height of the earth, the source of light and darkness, the source and plan of snow. The source and plan of rain, thunder, and lightning. Snow, rain, thunder, and lightning is not chance. Every snowflake, every drop, every thunder, every bolt of lightning is exactly how God wanted it. He controls the constellations. He controls the clouds, the lightning, the rain. He provides food for all living creatures. He controls the timing of all animal births. He controls the actions of every animal. The point of Job 38 and 39, no human being can fully comprehend God's control of the universe because no one is equal to God. And this includes the belief that fallen sinful human beings can and know how to control the climates of God's world. 
Do you see how ludicrous that is? Thinking we can control the climates. We can change it. God says, you cannot. You can't even control Leviathan. You can't even control when animals will give birth. Can you do this? Remember all those questions that God asks? Can you? Can you? What about this? What about this? And what is Job's response? I repent in dust and ashes. Think of it. If mankind were in control of any aspect of creation, what trouble we would be in. And because, and this is where I think really Job 38 and 39 comes to a point, because God controls the earth climates, you know what? You have to trust God in every circumstance. You have to trust God in every circumstance. God never gives Job an answer to the why am I suffering. God says, I am God, and you are not, so you must trust me. Conclusions. Everything that happens in creation can only be understood from God's written word. God is in control of history. God is in control of the Earth's climates, not man. Climate scientists, the government, the media, and hysterical individuals who call for radical changes are calling for the wrong changes. Melting glaciers, and they are melting. Rising sea levels, and they are rising. They are the result of the flood which God caused. Governments with either ocean boundaries or deserts should instead of dumping billions of dollars into reversing global warming, they should instead seek to use that money to effectively and economically address those trends. If the sea levels are rising and you live by the sea, instead of trying to figure out how to stop that from happening, maybe you should just move. <laughs> Radical calls costing billions of dollars actually harm mankind rather than help. So what about our evangelical brothers who say that the Great Commission now involves lessening global warming and they do so from an evolutionary atheistic basis? What do we say about them? Their response to the real changes in the climate that they are interpreting, their responses that are being controlled by atheistic evolutionary theory and saying that we have a responsibility as a church then, what they end up doing is corrupting Christ's commands to the church and distracting and derailing the church from obeying Christ. Boy, I have listed so many other things. But once they start going down that road, what does that do to the blood of Christ? Why did Jesus die? Did Jesus die to save the physical earth? No. Why not? Because he already promised in Genesis 8.22, it's going to continue. Why did Christ die? Christ died for sinners. To redeem them from sin. To save their souls. Why is it so important for Christ's church to understand from God's perspective through, through Scripture? The fact that you're here tells me that you were either, were either really looking forward to Matt preaching or you were looking forward to dinner, or maybe Brother Spence's message tonight. Maybe you thought about global warming. What does that have to do with the church? What does that have to do with the mission? Or the Christ Commission? I already know it's not right. It reminds me of when I was in college. I was talking to a, 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 a fellow collegian about an issue, and he said, well, I don't know what much that, I don't know much about that, but I know I'm against it. And I've heard that said in so many other ways. I don't know, but I'm against it. You know, something like that. Folks, you need to understand. You need to have reasons. You need to be able to think biblically through this. Mm -hmm. But does it affect our witness for Christ? Absolutely. Because you work with unbelievers. You're preaching the gospel to unbelievers. The folks in your church work with unbelievers. And they witness to unbelievers. 
And so you know what you can do when they bring something like this up? You can say, you know what? That's a good, that's an interesting thing. Let me tell you about the God of creation. Let me tell you what he's promised. Let me tell you what he will do. And let me tell you what you should do. Point them to Christ. You have believers in your church who hear this constantly and are bombarded by it. And if they are biblically ignorant, they can be swayed. Look up the word ignorance in your concordance in the New Testament sometime, and it's always, it's never a good thing. The church, what is the church? 1 Timothy 3.15, it is the pillar and ground support of the truth. We are supposed to declare it and defend it. And in Jude 3, the, the theme verse for the American Council, we must contend earnestly for the faith. And folks, God's truth regarding his creation, it is being twisted, it is being perverted, it is being corrupted, it is being ignored. And the church, the church is responsible for exposing error and declaring truth. And so this does touch the mission of the church because it does touch the fundamentals of the faith. It does touch the gospel. It does touch the mission of the church. Consider again the differences in responses to real changes in climate when they are viewed from God's word rather than evolutionary theory. We must always evaluate everything from God's point of view. And what's the only way you can do that? From the scriptures. 30 years ago this summer, my wife and I had the opportunity to work with a church planner. Before we had kids, seems like millennia ago. And that man gave me some advice that has stuck with me through the years that I have passed on. Dan, hide behind the word. The man never graduated from Bible college. But you know what? He's right. Hide behind the word. This is what God says. Don't say, I think. Don't say, I believe. Say, you know what? That's a good question. Or this is an interesting point. Let's see what God says about that issue. Bring them to the word of God. Why? Because when you bring them to the word of God, what tool does the spirit use to convict souls of sin? The spirit uses the word of God. It is quick and powerful. Divides to the very inner core of the human being? Why are people concerned? Because their eyes are blinded. Who's blinding the eyes? Satan is. What's the hope? The first message we have today, the gospel, the word of God. You have it. Use it. Preach it and give it. Our goal is not to convince unbelievers that their science, so-called, is wrong. Our goal is to tell them about Christ, to call them to repentance and faith, and we must teach and encourage Christians, trust the Lord and obey. Let's look to the Lord in prayer. I'm also going to ask God's blessing on the food. We're a little early, so just fellowship a little bit. Dinner is in the little chapel across the, the way here. You need to go on the back side, correct? Okay. Let's pray. God in heaven, I thank you that we have your word, that it is truth from beginning to end. Every word, even the letters, Lord, are inspired by you. You moved those biblical authors, protected them from error, guided them so that what was written was exactly what you wanted written. There is not a single scrap of error or untruth in it. It is all true. And Lord, we have the great privilege of believing it, and not only believing it, but proclaiming it and teaching it. Lord, we live in a time where there is much untruth, much error being promoted and taught. Lord, this is not a time for us to cower. This is not a time, Lord, for us to leave it up to the experts. But Lord, this is a time to give your word and to simply hide behind it. And know that you are the God of the heavens and the earth, and you laugh at those who oppose you. Help my brothers and sisters, Lord, to love you and to show their love for you by giving the truth of the gospel. 
I thank you, Lord, for the opportunity now that we have to enjoy some fellowship around the table. Thank you, Lord, so much for Davidson Baptist's yes. great hospitality that we are about to partake of uh, through this meal. Give us strength through it. Help us to encourage those who've labored, and we ask your blessing upon them and the food to our bodies, our fellowship time. In Jesus' name we pray.